All right, it is 12.02 here, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Amy Webb, and myself and colleagues have a lot to share with you today for our spring 2023 NHSN vendor webinar. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items. So you should have received the slides via email on Friday or sorry, Thursday, I believe. Uh, so you can refer to those. If you haven't gotten the slides, you can email the CDA help desk at nhsncda at cdc.gov and we can share the slides with you. You'll notice that there are a handful of slides that are slightly different than the version you've received. Um, not substantial changes though. So you'll see the updated version posted on the website in a few months. Um, if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to put them in the Q&A and we will either answer them, type them back or answer them live at the end of the call. If you have technical webinar related questions like you can't see the slides or something like that, you can put those in the webinar chat. Uh, and with that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna quickly share the agenda here. Uh, Dr. Andrea Benin will do an introduction next. We'll have some general release updates um, followed by some COVID module, COVID-19 module updates and talk about things that have happened in the release 11.3 that was just uh, a few weeks ago and then some future releases. Then we have some great information about our new fire measures. And then uh, we'll have a ses section about the long-term care EHR implementation then a gender variable update followed by some AUR module updates and then our, our usual agenda items of the MPPT and miscellaneous vendor services. So with that, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Andrea Benin. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you everyone for joining today. We really appreciate your attention and participation. Um, Amy, if you want to move to the slide here. So over the next e years, really, NHSN is in the process of implementing, particularly for the hospital type facilities, implementing measurement and measurement activity that is based on fire based approaches to data collection. And so we're going to be coming to you with instructions and implementation guides and approaches to handling the transfer of data using FHIR. This means that our measure specifications are uh, coming, going to be coming out and they're going to look a little bit different and they're going to be based on patient level data elements. So those future initiatives that are happening over the next, starting this year and into the next years are listed on this slide. Uh, the first one that is happening is hypoglycemia, and we do have a test facility that is currently submitting fire bundles to us um, uh, in, a, in a test fashion, um, but we're in the process of enrolling facilities to test out our approaches for C. difficile and hospital onset bacteremia, and then hopefully by the end of this year, um, respiratory pathogens and venous thromboembolism will also be folded into that. So we're going to be in a test fashion over the next months. Um, then hopefully by the time we meet with you again, we'll have a better handle on the timeline for when we would be opening things up for voluntary submission from other facilities. We'll start opening things up by, you know, allowing for voluntary data submission and um, that will give us time to iterate and improve the measurement um, that's gonna happen. And so we're working very closely to ensure that we're able to bring in these data elements that are needed using fire-based approaches in um, a standards-based fashion. And we are likely to have lots of questions and, and want to request lots of dialogue with you. So. As we're pursuing this, we'll be reaching out um, more and more, hopefully, for um, input and interaction over how to make these efforts be as successful and uh, streamlined as possible. All of this really relates to the NHSN digital measures work 
And this is this is our this is our you know beginning list of, of what will come out as NHSN digital measures. Um, you know the the ones at the top of the list are more set in stone, um, and then as we get to the bottom of the list, they're they're concepts. So, um, you know, through the listing here of respiratory pathogen surveillance, where um, you know through those top ones we have concrete plans. Um, in the course of this year or so. And then the other three at the bottom will evolve over time um, afterwards. So these are what our future initiatives look like. And I'm going to uh, hand the, uh, the talking stick, so to speak, over to Pamela Cran to, to launch you throughout the day here. Uh, thank you very, or through the, the meeting. Thank you very much for your work with us and all of your attention. And please let us know if you have any questions. I'm gonna to need to drop off, but I know that the team here will handle uh, questions and, and track questions if they need my attention. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bennon, for that introduction. I am Pamela Crayon. I'm the team lead for the CDA support team, as well as the business analysis manager for the NHSN application. Uh, Amy, next slide, please. So our release schedule overview, we continue with a major release a year, and that's our end of the year release that is effective January 1st of each year. This major release includes protocol changes as well as transition to new CDA versions due to those protocol changes. We also have uh, minor releases throughout the year that occur on an eight week basis. So normally it's probably about five to six minor releases and these releases include new components or modules, minor change requests, as well as defect resolutions and any infrastructure maintenance and support we may have. Users are notified via our message alert when logging into NHSN. Next slide, please. So we just had our release 11.3 on April the 14th. Our next scheduled release is June 10th, release 11.4. We will have defect fixes that will be effective post that deployment and our change requests, new requirements will be effective June 12th. Following the 11.4 release, we have our release 11.5, which will be scheduled for August the 5th. And again, those change requests will be effective on that Monday, August the 7th, and the defect fixes will be effective post deployment. Next slide, please. I am now transitioning over to Sylvia to give updates for our PS COVID-19 module. Hello, everyone. I'm Sylvia Schuler. I'm a BA. QA analyst on the NSHN team, and I also provide CDA support for the vendors and facilities. In the next slides, I will cover the updates for patient safety COVID-19 module. Next slide. Reporting of the COVID-19 hospital data will take place in the patient safety component of the NSHN using web form interface and CSV upload. There will be no impact on changes for reporting for the long-term care facility, dialysis, and healthcare personnel vaccination COVID-19 modules in the NSHN. The reporting process for COVID-19 hospital data will remain the same. Next slide. CSB files can be submitted via direct and API submission and is also available for upload directly in the patient safety component. Instructions on how to sign up and use these methods and guidance for reporting COVID-19 data can be found at the links provided in this slide. Questions can be sent to the NHSN at cdc.gov and include COVID-19 hospital in the subject line. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Hamna Bay, to discuss uh, release 11.3 updates. Hi everyone, I'm Hamna Beg, business analyst and a quality assurance analyst on the NHSN project and support, I support tickets relating to issue reported for a CDS submission. In the next slides, 
I will be covering release 11.3 update. Next slide, please. Biovigilance, adding pathogen reduce, cryoprecipitated fibrogen complex to monthly denominators in the hemovigilance module. Edit for manual entry in the UI only. Ability to send and CDA to follow. For the next slide, I will pass over to my colleague, Pamela Crayon, to discuss about CDA HI vocabulary. Thanks. Thank you, Hamna. So we did have some updates to our CDA HAI vocabulary. Thank you. Um, so we added the codes, the biovigilance codes for the pathogen reduced cryoprecipitated fibrinogen, excuse me, as follows. So we added 1346-6, um, which will be our number of units transfused, and 1347-4, which is the number of discards. This is a reminder that our value sets are specified in the CDA implementation guides that have been distributed in the spreadsheet, HAI underscore VOC. Um, and they are all available in the VSAC uh, website, um, the Value Set Authority Center. You can find all of our value sets there. Next slide, please. I'm passing over back to Sylvia. Thanks, Pam. In the next slides, I will discuss the change request for the neonatal component for release 11.4. For release 11.4, scheduled for June of this year, 2023, NSHN will implement the ability to manually upload late onset sepsis, loss, and meningitis, men, CDA files directly in NSHN. The counterpart direct automation for lost men CDA imports was import, implemented in September of 2021. So going forward after the 11.4, we'll be able to manually as well as send lost men bill direct automation. I will now turn it back over to Pam. Thank you. So our end of the year, the future release 12.0. Next slide, please. Uh, which will be December 2023, but effective January 1st, 2024, we will be implementing the new implementation guide R4D2 for uh, patient safety, the MDRO summary. This version includes new observation sections to provide responses to IPF slash earth questions required for CMS reporting. So whether the facility contains a CMS certified inpatient psychiatric unit or whether the facility contains a CMS certified inpatient rehabilitation unit. So that will be available effective January 1st, 2024. Next slide, please. So at this moment, we will go through an overview of the different fire measures that we're implementing. Um, and Dr. Andrea Benning gave you a, a brief intro of some of those that we have. And first up will be Denise for the patient safety component. Hi, um, you the next slide. You'll see here that we are expanding the patient safety component. Uh, we already have several different little cabooses here, but uh, the patient safety component is the primary method of surveillance and reporting used by um, all of our acute care hospitals, long-term care hospitals, rehabs, cancer centers, um, et cetera. And this is where you're going to put your HAI and healthcare events along with antimicrobial use, uh, adherence to prevention practices, and your stewardship program. Next slide, please. Our newest uh, module <clears throat> for reporting is entitled uh, HT-CDI and then separately HOB, which my colleague Dominique will speak to briefly next. The HTCDI is the module that is intended to capture uh, inpatient hospital antibiotic treated C. difficile infections. The eligible facilities would be any inpatient facility that's already enrolled in the NHS inpatient safety component. 
Uh, we have not expanded this reporting to long-term care facilities or to outpatient dialysis facilities at this time. The measure is a digital one. It will require a HL7 fire approach. Um, manual and CDA data transmission will not be available for this module. And for this reason, facilities must work with their vendors to enable data transmission across fire uh, to NHSN. Next slide, please. Specifically, the HT-CDI module is intended to be an improvement uh, on the current uh, C. difficile outcome measure used with many quality programs. Um, it is a uh, antibiotic and laboratory finding positive testing methodology. Our definition will be specifically a positive C. difficile test on or after day four and five of C. difficile antibiotic treatment. We are going to offer complementary metrics, which will include test utilizations and community onset CDI counts. And the key data elements that we will be looking to uh, receive will come from the microbiology and the medication portions of the patient record. Next slide, please. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dominique Godfrey, to discuss hospital onset bacteremia and fungemia. Hello. For the hospital onset bacteremia and fungemia, which is, again, another fire measure, the purpose of HLB is for surveillance for broader reduction of bloodstream infections. And this is regardless of the organism that is identified. <clears throat> Additionally, this measure does not take into account association with device, so such as the current central line associated bloodstream infection measure. The definition for HOB would be a blood culture collected on day four or after with a pathogenic bacteria or fungi. And again, some of the complementary metrics are blood culture utilization, contamination, community onset bacteremia and fungemia, as well as matching commensal hospital onset bacteremia. The key element for this measure will be microbiology in the patient's current medical record. Next slide, please. For both HT-CDI and HOB, these are queried, both we use queried fire resources and um, data elements. The data will be collected from the emergency department, observation units, and inpatient location, and inpatients who are present at the facility during the reporting period. The facility's fire endpoint will expose only selected and pre-specified fire resources that are invoked upon permission. And then the data access can be controlled on a fire resource by resource basis. Next slide, please. For NHSN, for the HOB and the HTCDI measure, um, we it was anticipated for an April release. Uh, the protocols are currently available to our collab participants. Um, for, for selected U.S. hospitals, activation um, there has been activation of both HOB and HTCDI, as well as completion of the NHSN annual survey and completion of the annual reporting plan for each of the modules, HOB and HTCDI. Um, in addition, user and group rights have been enabled and the NHSN fire endpoint integration to pull those selected fire resources that will be necessary or that are necessary for calculating the HOV and H2-CDI module metrics. Next slide, please. So the projected 
the projected timeline for these modules or quarter two of 2023 would be um, would have been the beta version of both HOB and HTCDI and those um, modules were or will be launched for selected and early adopters of the pilot and or pilot sites. And then um, the measure, the information will be reviewed and revisions will be made as per the results from the beta testing. It is anticipated um, for quarter four, 2023 to quarter one of 2024, that these modules will open to all sites um, that have the capability to pull the information via fire. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jennifer Watkins, to discuss the next module. Hello, um, I'm going to provide a brief update on another one of our up and coming electronic surveillance modules, Respiratory Pathogen Surveillance, or RPS. The RPS module is being developed to meet the national needs for more comprehensive and timely surveillance of hospitalizations due to respiratory pathogens. We're starting with surveillance for COVID-19, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, and we plan to add additional pathogens in the future. The patient population for surveillance will be patients of all ages who are admitted to an acute care facility, and we will be looking at microbiology and medication data to make case determinations of either laboratory confirmed cases or therapeutic confirmed cases. And we'll also be looking at transmission-based precautions data in relation to these three pathogens. Next slide, please. Facilities that will be eligible for RPS are all inpatient acute care facilities enrolled at the NHSN patient safety component. In the future, we also plan to include long-term care facilities. Unlike the other measures, other electronic measures, RPS will offer near real-time surveillance and case determinations, and will offer two options for data submission. Data submission for RPS will be daily electronic submission via, the, via either comma-separated values, files via direct or manual upload, or via HL7 fire. Data submission via manual entry and CDA, CDA import will not be offered. Next slide, please. The projected pre-production launch for both the CSV and FHIR beta versions is August of 2023 for pilot sites. From there, we'll we review and the data and make any necessary revisions prior to launching the module for additional sites. And as a reminder, please send any questions about the new electronic measures to nhsn at cdc.gov. And now I'd like to turn this over to Nadine. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. Next slide. So with the April release, NHSN will make available to selected US hospital partners, the first version of the new NHSN component medication safety, um, which was talked about briefly at the beginning. So this first module within the component will address medication related hypoglycemia or low blood sugar related to diabetes medications like insulin. Next slide. The goal of the NHSN glycemic control hypoglycemia module is to establish an EHR neutral standard for submitting inpatient medication related hypoglycemia data electronically to NHSN with the objectives of supporting US hospitals in measuring medication related hypoglycemia to improve glycemic management and facilitating national benchmarking of medication related hypoglycemia rates. Next slide. The facilities that will be eligible to report to the NHSN glycemic control module will include all inpatient facilities enrolled in NHSN um, MSC, with the exception of long-term facilities and outpatient dialysis facilities. Those are not yet eligible. As with the other modules that are dependent on FHIR, um, this module would also require um, a, a FHIR R4 API, uh, so FHIR uh, version R4 or higher for participation, and facilities must work with their EHR vendors to enable um, data transmission via the NHSN FHIR endpoint. Next slide. 
what data will be collected? Will be collected for selected inpatients, and these are inpatients who are receiving diabetes medications. So NHSL and VFI will identify the patients, for example, over a one month period who are receiving diabetes medications during their inpatient stay. And then the facility will expose the endpoints or the resources that are um, required to inform calculation of the hypoglycemia rates. And for those familiar, these are the fire resources that NHSN will ask for to be able to calculate the hypoglycemia rates and provide those back to the hospital. Excuse me. Data access can be controlled on a fire resource by resource basis, and the facility will have full knowledge of which resources are being invoked or asked for. Next slide. So what will be available in April, similar to what was mentioned before, um, to the selected hospitals that are participating in the NHSN CoLab, they will be able to activate the MSC, the medication safety component, complete the annual survey that pertains to this module. It's a new annual survey specific to this, to this um, module to be able to complete the monthly reporting plan um, that also includes permission for um, uh, the data pulled by FHIR. And then there are, there's integration essentially of the NHSN FHIR endpoint with the hospital's FHIR endpoint to pull the selected FHIR resources mentioned on the previous slide. Next slide. Um, these are the, the measures, uh, a summary of the metrics, I guess, NHSN will produce based on the data submitted to NHSN. And um, the primary measure plan is one that will be aligned with the CMS Hospital Quality Reporting Program, Hospital Heart Se Severe Hypoglycemia Measure. So this is already an ECQM or electronic, electronic clinical quality measure that's part of the CMS Quality Reporting Program. So um, this is part of CDC and CMS alignment um, in terms of measure reporting. The remainder metrics are ones that are um, there to support um, uh, facility level quality improvement and patient safety dashboards for glycemic control. What's most important is that um, to emphasize here is that it's not expected that the vendors or the hospitals will calculate these metrics. The FHIR data will pull the resources for those patients on diabetes medications that will allow the NHSN application to calculate those metrics and provide those analytic reports back to the facility with options for additional reports based on the line level data that's collected. Next slide. Thank you. We anticipate um, the glycemic control module to be released in phases uh, with the April release making available selected facility reports, um, such as the primary metric that we, we that um, I mentioned earlier, uh, maybe a line listing of the patients who had that uh, particular event, which is um, severe hypoglycemia. And later phases will provide uh, more uh, better ability to stratify or benchmark and eventually we'll be moving into hyper high blood sugar, hyperglycemia metrics. And with that, I'll turn it over to um, the nursing home discussion. Thank you, Janita. <clears throat> Thanks, Nadine. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Janita Bell, and I am the post-acute care team lead for NHSN. Today, I'll talk about the EHR CDA implementation project for nursing homes. And this is a very important project. As you heard from my, the previous pre presenters, uh, long-term care facilities are not eligible for all the other electronic measures and other development solutions that are happening across NHSN. Next slide, please. And there's a reason for all of that. Uh, as we all particularly know, nursing homes are less resourced than hospitals, and that limits their ability to perform various infection prevention and control activities. I mean, for example, they have less clinical staff and technical capabilities for national surveillance, particularly with the engagement that's necessary in order to report to NHSN. Additionally, you know, they serve a population that's vulnerable to adverse outcomes and events uh, secondary to healthcare associated infections, which makes it very important to develop innovative methods to support them, to enable them to provide information important for public health response, as was demonstrated by the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic itself, COVID-19, exacerbated these very things that I just outlined to you. And um, these have been particular pain points for nursing homes to continue to provide data to NHSN. Even before 2019, we had 
NHS and understood that these pain points would limit voluntary reporting among nursing homes. Uh, in fact, by 2018, only 2,300 reported out of the 15,600 CMS certified nursing homes that now report to NHSN under mandate. So to alleviate this problem and reduce the requirements of uh, manual reporting, we created an implementation guide in consultation with Lantana Consulting Group uh, to develop an electronic HAI reporting standards based on clinical document architecture or CDA and also allow capabilities for fire. Next slide. So with the project itself, it has this overarching objective and purpose. Um, we want to ensure that CDA implementation guidance enables EHR systems to abstract data in accordance with NHSN protocols on behalf of nursing homes to reduce nursing home data collection burden. And here's our, our core objectives. We want to obtain participation of EHR vendors that service nursing homes, assess the feasibility of EHR vendors to implement the CDA implementation guide to capture laboratory identified events. In this particular circumstance, the implementation guide was developed for clostridioides difficile infection events that are laboratory identified as well as multi-drug resistant organisms. We also plan to validate what the EHR data collection uh, receives and make sure that it meets NHSN specifications. And we will also compare EHR uh, and manually reported CDI data to verify concordance and accuracy of the data that have been collected. Next slide. So here are uh, the results that we hope to obtain from the, the study participation and feedback from vendors. Uh, we would like to understand EHR vendor experiences with the CDA fire implementation guide, understand the technical challenges that were faced while implementing or validating the CDA or fire implementation guide for CDIs in particular, clostridioides difficile infections. Uh, we hope to also understand the challenges in training or getting nursing homes to use the functionality for EHR-based collection. And uh, these information, all this information will inform our proposed changes. So we'll have the opportunity to take that feedback and uh, re-evaluate the implementation guide as it currently stands to make revisions that would improve the ability of EHR vendors to participate on behalf of their nursing home customers. Next slide, please. So here's the timeline. It extends from 2023 to 2024. We actually had the kickoff meeting with uh, awardee Arbor Research at the end of 2022 and began several activities, as you can see, that are outlined here. Our major tasks are outlined on the left-hand side, the first column. And uh, we are still in the stage of recruiting nursing homes and EHR vendors to participate. So if you're not involved and you hope to be involved and, and think you may contribute in some way, we definitely welcome you to uh, come on board. You can email NHSN in order to uh, notify us about your interest. Uh, we also have uh, a number of activities that allow some communication between uh, our awardee, Arbor Research, and the EHR vendors, as well as the nursing homes to get the information that we need in order to accomplish the objectives that I previously highlighted. And we should wrap things up by early 2024. Next slide. And so this slide, I just wanted to bring this back up. I believe Pam had mentioned it earlier, just as a reminder that there's a slew of activities that are associated with this project. And as a result, we do have some development that's happening from the NHS inside that will enable us to receive the uh, lab ID data via CDA for both the numerator data, the denominator data. We're also uh, enabling direct automation that will allow uh, CDA imports to be done completely electronically. And uh, we have two releases that will solidify the, the complete package for that. And in true NHSN fashion, we will provide additional details about when our different toolkits and uh, other documentation to assist you will be available on our web pages. But that's not up yet and will be soon to come. That concludes my portion, and I'll hand it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Thanks, Janita. Um, Again, I'm Jennifer Watkins with the NHSN Protocol and Training Team. Uh, next slide, please. 
I know back at the fall 2022 meeting, we had presented our plan to phase in the implementation of the sex at birth and gender identity variables. However, we've not yet received um, Office of Management and Budget or OMB approval for these fields. And this was an unexpected delay and has caused us to pause the implementation of these fields. Next slide, please. So we are requesting approval for these variables again this year. And if we receive approval, we'll be implementing the variables as follows. Uh, starting January 1st, 2024, the variables Variables will be optional reporting via manual entry and CSV import. And then in January of 2025, those fields will become required reporting and CDA import will become available for these fields. Next slide, please. Um, I just wanna quickly review the proposed variables in the next few slides. Sex at birth or birth sex is a sex assigned at birth and is intended to capture administrative sex. The options will be male, female, and unknown. And this field will be located in the patient demographic section. Next slide, please. And this is a look at the administrative sex value set from the Value Set Authority Center or VSAC. And this was provided by, to us by Sarah Gaunt of the Lantanas Consulting Group. Next slide, please. The gender identity variable is defined as gender identity as reported by the patient. And the options for reporting the variable are listed here on this slide. This field would be located on the event and procedure forms and is intended to capture the patient's gender identity at the time of the encounter. It was originally designed as a single selection field, but we've had requests to allow for multiple selections and we are exploring impl implementing that option. Next slide, please. Uh, the next few slides are screenshots that show the de gender identity value sets from VSAC. Um, and this slide here contains links to the value set. Next slide, please. And this is a look at the gender identity value set in VSAC. Next slide, please. And this last slide shows the value set for the two no flavors, ASPA, unknown, and other. Um, again, as a reminder, please send any questions about these variables to us at nhsn at cdc.gov and include the variable names and the subject line. Next slide, please. And now I'll turn it over to Melissa. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm Melissa Mojica, one of the subject matter experts from the AUR team, and I will provide, I will be providing an overview of previous application updates. Next slide, please. There was a known issue which was preventing facilities from successfully uploading January 2023 AU option files via manual upload and direct. This has now been resolved and January 2023 AU option data can be uploaded. Next slide, please. This change doesn't have CDA impact, but we wanted to let you know about the updated language throughout the NHSN application and our public website from the Meaningful Use Program to the Promoting Interoperability Program. Amy will talk a bit more about the PI program coming up in, a, in the webinar. Next slide, please. We update the message displayed during the manual CDA upload process. Previously, the same message appeared regardless of how many files within the zip actually successfully uploaded into NHSN. The message has been updated to make it, the upload results more clear, promoting users to click the show report button and ultimately help users have a better understanding of the CDA data upload process. Next slide, please. We've updated the display name for the code IMIPWC from Emapenum with Celestatin to just Emapenum. This does not affect what is accepted by NHSN. This change reflects the true susceptibility test completed by labs and aligns with the LOINC description since psilostatin is not an antimicrobial. It just enhances the imipenem when administered together in certain situations. Psilostatin is also not included in susceptibility tests for imipenem. Next slide. We shared this defect on our last call, and unfortunately, we had to move the fix out to a future release. As previously noted, the defect allows facilities to report AU option data from locations that are not eligible for AUR reporting. 
The locations include the endoscopy suite and the sleep study unit. Please note that the AUR eligible locations are indicated with a Y in the AUR column of the locations code tab of the IDM. Next up is my colleague, Virgie Fields. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. I'm Virgie Fields, one of the public health analysts on the NHSN AUR team. I'll briefly discuss our AUR plans for the upcoming 12.0 NHSN release at the end of the year. Next slide, please. For updates to AU drugs, this will refer to the antimicrobial ingredients tab in the IDM, which we included a screenshot below. Uh, we plan to add Reza fungin to the list of antifungals. We may also add other drugs, but that's still up for discussion. Next slide, please. For updates to the AR pathogens, um, this will refer to the pathogen codes preferred tab in the IDM. We plan to add Citrobacter frondii complex, Citrobacter brachii, and Citrobacter youngi. We plan to remove Leliotia amnigena, which was formerly Enterobacter amnigenus. And then we also plan to refresh the pathogen roll-up workbook. Next slide, please. For updates to AR drug panels, this will refer to the AR AST tab in the IDM. We plan to add high level long terms for high potency gentamicin and streptomycin for the enterococcus drug panel, which is the NTP23 panel. And next slide, please. Finally, Updates to AR events. Um, as mentioned earlier, the addition of sex at birth and gender identity to the CDA files is delayed until January 2025. Once that change is made, then AU and AR summary will update to a new IG version to be on the same IG as AR per ONC's request. Next slide, please. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Amy Webb. Thanks, Virgie. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the AR synthetic data set or AR SDS. Uh, so as you all know, the requirement starts in just a few days now um, in May 2023. So that means AR summary records for May 2023 must include that vendor ID and SDS validation ID. Similarly, AR event records with the specimen collection dates of May 1st, 2023 and after have to include those two variables, the vendor ID and SDS validation ID. Um, lots of you have been working on that on ARSDS and many of you have passed. We're actually up to 13 vendor software products that have been successfully validated. So great job, everyone. Um, a quick update though, for the ARSDS, we plan to release version 1.5 uh, within the next week or so. We're currently working on testing. We've updated just one of the data tables, the culture result data table to resolve an isolate that was only tested for ineligible antimicrobials. So we'll be posting that soon and I'll send out a blast email to everyone when that's ver updated, when that version is updated. But I wanted to make sure you all were aware that if you've already passed at ARSDS, you are not expected to revalidate. Uh, so have no fear. <laughs> if you've already passed, you do not need to do anything with this update. Okay, so a quick aside, uh, related to ARSDS, we've gotten a couple questions about the pathogens and pathogen rollups um, from some vendors as they've been working through the ARSDS process. So I wanted to take some time on today's call to highlight that. So as you remember, our definition of a duplicate AR event isolate is uh, the same species or genus when the identification to the species level is not provided isolated from the same source, specifically invasive or non-invasive, from the same patient on the same day. So that's considered a same day duplicate. So then all of our organisms listed in the AR option pathogen roll-up workbook that's in the toolkit are eligible for submission. So as we've mentioned in the AR SDS materials, as well as the AUR module protocol, Facilities and vendors should first perform the roll-up of organisms before applying any subsequent reporting rules. 
So the pathogen roll-up workbook, as you know, lists all the eligible organisms. So there's just over a thousand of the eligible codes. At the same time, we also use the IDM pathogen codes. Uh, in this case, it's the 2023 preferred tab that lists all the specimens, the SNOMED codes in that the application will accept. So that's 97 codes. But of those 97 that the application will accept, 20 of those are considered the drug resistant organism code. Uh, they have an X in the drug resistant organism column on that tab. So that's column AK as highlighted with the red box on the far right of the screen. So when you upload an AR event or any event uh, with these specific SNOMED codes, NHSN will automatically roll these codes up to the parent concept. And that the column G, the new code column, shows what parent concept will be saved in the application. So if we're looking at the first row here, row 21 for multidruggers and acinetobacter, that has an X in the drug resistant organism column. And if we were to look at column G, new code, we can see ACS asterisk one. So that means multidrug resistant organ, uh, multidrug resistant acinetobacter is going to be rolled up to genus acinetobacter or ACS when you upload an AR event with this code to NHSN. So it's important to remember to take into account these 20 codes that NHSN rolls up when you're applying the deduplication rules. Let's walk through a quick example here. So I have a patient who on January 1st has genus acinetobacter isolated from a blood culture. And then on January 5th, multidrug resistant acinetobacter was isolated also from a blood culture. So when you're deciding which ones to report to NHSN, you have to think first about whether they're um, from the same invasive or non-invasive specimen source group. So these are both from blood cultures. So the 14 day rule will apply. So you'd want to review the organism roll up to determine if these meet criteria for being the same species or genus when identification to the species level is not provided. So first we start with the pathogen roll-up workbook and I have the codes highlighted in red boxes here, both genus Acinetobacter, row two and row five, multiple drug resistant Acinetobacter have NA in columns D and E, the MAP2 columns. That means that the SNOMED code in column B can be directly reported to NHSN. Okay, so then the next step would be to refer to the IDM. We're looking at the IDM pathogen codes 2023 preferred tab. And here I have row 21 on the bottom screenshot highlighted here from multidrug resistant acinate factor. And as previously mentioned, this is one of those drug resistant organism codes. So you can see ACS asterisk one, and then in the row directly above that, you can see the code ACS. So that's what uh, the application will roll up multidrug resistant acinetobacter 2 immediately upon upload. So going back to our example here for the January 1st isolate, um, yes, that event is reported to NHSN. That's the patient's first blood culture and genus acinetobacter is isolated. For the January 5th isolate, that would not be reported to NHSN because multidrug resistant acinetobacter will be rolled up to genus acinetobacter by NHSN. And it's been less than 14 days since the last positive culture for that patient from the blood culture that isolated genus acinetobacter. So the January 5th would be considered a duplicate isolate and not reported. All right, so feel free to put any questions about pathogens in the, the Q&A and we can get to them later, or you can always email us if you have specific questions about that. So switching gears now to the CMS Promoting Operability Program, just wanted to make sure that you all were aware that beginning next year in calendar 2024, the AUR module data, are, AUR module 
data are required under the public health and clinical data exchange objective of the CMSPI program. So that means that eligible hospitals and critical access hospitals that participate in that CMS program have to submit, well, have to attest to being in active engagement with NHSN to report these data or claim an applicable exclusion. And I want to point out that uh, CMS considers this a single measure, AUR as a single measure, whereas for NHSN purposes, we can we separate them, AU and AR. So for uh, the CMSPI program, both AU and AR option data are expected to be reported. There are two ways, though, that facilities can be in active engagement with NHSN. The first option is just pre-production and validation. That just requires the facilities to register their intent to submit AUR data within the NHS application, and then uh, the testing and validation of the CDA files. So they would send us one CDA file of each CDA type, one AU, one for AR event, and one for AR summary, and ideally containing test data. And we would validate that, that, that those files indeed um, pass the, the business rules. And then the, the next option, option two, is like the higher level, that's production submission. So facilities would need to submit production, AU and AR data to NHSN. Um, for this calendar year, 2023, AUR is a available for bonus points. So if they wanted those bonus points this calendar year, they would submit 90 continuous days of AUR data. Uh, for next year, when the requirement kicks into gear, it is 180 continuous days of AUR data submission. So the facilities could attest next year to just being in option one, pre-production validation, and they would not need to submit production data yet. But if they do that in calendar year 2024, attest to option one, then in 2025, they have to move to production submission. So that was included in the most recent CMS rule where you can facilities can only spend one calendar year in option one. So our questions, uh, our, our requirements for you all, um, as you know, in order to upload AU and soon AR data, you have to have your software be NHSN validated. So that's the SDS work. Um, and you know that the application will prevent your files from uploading if they don't contain the vendor credentials. And then also your software has to be ONC certified, but that process is outlined by ONC and the, the testing and certification and the posting of all that, that's um, maintained and managed by the ONC. And a vendor nice to have. Um, so I have mentioned in option one, the pre-production validation phase, facilities have to send files for validation. That is something that's um, CMS program wide. So it's not, not our requirement, but the CMS requirement. So that those test files are expected to be the exact same XML files uh, that would be you know, sent with production uh, information, except ideally they would contain test data. And as I mentioned, just one file for each type is what's required for that validation. Um, so if possible, it would be great if there, if you have test files available for your facilities, um, have them ready uh, for when they may ask for them. Um, if you're not able to produce files with test data, they, facilities are able to send production files to us. They have to send them securely because they do have the um, patient information in them, but it would be ideal if instead um, you would be able to populate some files with just test data in them. And then the facilities can use those to fulfill this, this required step uh, of the process. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Laura. Thanks so much, Amy, and I'm going to go over some of the AU data quality outreach we have recently performed. Next slide. Uh, so as many of you may know, because you may have heard from your facilities, um, we completed some 
uh, data quality outreach for incompatible routes of administration recently while preparing for the 2021 AU option data report. We noted antimicrobial days, <clears throat> excuse me, reported for certain antimicrobials via routes for which they are not commercially available. And this may represent off-label use or a potential mapping error. We notified facilities with AU data reported via incompatible, off-label, or unusual routes during 2021 and 2022. And we asked those facilities to review the affected data, correct mappings going forward if needed, and correct and then re-upload incorrect retrospective data if that's possible for them. Uh, thank you to everyone who helped facilities with this request so far. Next slide. Uh, so we reached out to 485 facilities and 427 responded. Of those 427, 159 indicated that their data were already correct. 255 indicated that their data were incorrect. And 13 indicated that they were not able to tell if their data were correct or incorrect. Of the 255 who indicated that their data were incorrect, 79 were able to correct their retrospective data during the outreach period. 176 were unable to correct their retrospective data. Um, and just to note that all of these facilities were able to correct their mappings going forward. So this shouldn't be an issue for 2023 data. Next slide. Uh, just a clarification on our part, occasionally we send outreach for antimicrobial administrations that seem unusual or we would like to learn more about. The goal is to determine if the data submitted to NHSN are correct based on which routes of administration were reported. Facilities should continue reporting data based on how the drugs are actually being, being administered to patients, regardless of what formulation is used and whether it's considered incompatible, off-label, or unusual use. Facilities may ask you to stop reporting antimicrobials administered via off-label or unusual routes to avoid receiving data quality outreach emails. Uh, we're just asking that you say no to this request. We would still like to receive all antimicrobial administrations from all eligible routes. Next slide. So which routes are eligible to report to the NHSN AU option? We have four eligible routes, intravenous or IV, intramuscular or IM, digestive, which is anything between the rectum and the mouth, uh, and respiratory or inhaled. Some examples of ineligible routes for the AU option are intracavity, including interpleural, interperitoneal, or interpericardial, topical, including ophthalmic, or in the eye, and otic, in the ear, antibiotic locks, interventricular, irrigation, and interductal. Next slide. Some key takeaways we learned from this outreach. Um, we wanted to remind everybody that the interpleural route is not eligible for AU option reporting and should be excluded. Uh, while intranasal antimicrobial administrations do start in the nose, which is part of the respiratory system, irrigation is the clinical purpose of most intranasal administrations and they should be excluded from AU option reporting. For antimicrobial mouthwashes, uh, swish and swallow would count as a digestive administration for the AU option, while swish and spit would not count and should be excluded from AU option reporting. Inhalation powder mi mixed into bone cement for the purpose of infection prevention during surgery should be excluded from AU option reporting. Um, while they are using inhalation powder, the patient is not actually inhaling it, so it's not being administered via an eligible route of administration. And finally, antimicrobials used for irrigation via NG tube as preparation for organ donation are eligible digestive antimicrobial use for the AU option. And just to note that other NHSN modules have exclusions for organ donation, but currently the AU option does not. Next slide. Now I'll hand it over to Allison for some additional updates. Thank you, Laura. We can move to the next slide. Alrighty, so before we open up our poll for response, um, I just wanted to give some background on why we're asking about succession management. We do often get questions from users at uh, facilities asking why they're getting an error message saying that um, an existing version is already in a NHSN. Um, so we're just trying to kind of gauge, um, you know, where you guys are at with offering succession management within your software. Um, 
So this would be an example of the error that a facility would receive if they try to upload something without increasing the version number um, in the CDA file. And as you can tell, it, it is definitely a little bit confusing. Um, so it is we definitely do recommend um, implementing some succession management or supporting that with the facilities that you provide uh, your services to. And with that, I think we can go ahead and open the poll up. Um, so if you wouldn't mind responding as to whether or not your software supports succession management if users uh, simply re-export the files from your system. And we'll go ahead and give this about 30 seconds. All right, I think we can go ahead and close the poll. Um, okay. So it looks like Okay, so it looks like the majority of you said yes, your software does support succession management. Um, a couple said no, and then we had a few that were unsure. Um, thank you, everyone, for responding, and we will definitely keep this in mind uh, moving forward and how we can best support uh, the AUR module with this. We can move to the next slide, please. Alrighty, and then just another reminder, the annual training sessions will be posted soon, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, so you can find them on both the AUR training webpage, which is linked in this slide, and the CDC NHSN annual training webpage. The AUR training page will have the sessions that we hosted for the year, which were priorities for hospital core element implementation, AUR module reporting for the CMS promoting interoperability or PI program, um, the AU option reporting, AR option incidents and prevalence reports, and AR option benchmarking metrics. We can move to the next slide. And with that, I'll pass it over to Hamna. Thank you. In the next slides, I will discuss about NHSN pre-production test site and PPT. Next slide. NHSN pre-production test site or NPPT is available for all the vendors. NPPT allows vendor to test their code in prior to NHSN deployment. To request a test site, please follow the instruction on the slide and send completed form to the CDA team. Next slide, please. When logging into NPPT, please read important message at login. NPPT is currently on version 11.3.0.4. We will try to update as soon as possible to allow testing for upcoming releases. Any issue found in testing, please send an email to nhsncda at cdc.gov. Next slide, please. For the next slide, I will pass over to my colleague, Sylvia Schuler. Thank you. Thanks, Hamna. In the next slides, I will cover additional information that will provide guidance and resources for implementing and processing of CDA files. Next slide. Quick update for CDA automation, direct automation. Traffic has continued to increase significantly. We have approximately 77 direct addresses and over 9,500 facilities sending bill CDA direct automation. For those of you who are not using direct yet, it is a batch submission process with no immediate reply. We typically request to allow 24 hours for processing. However, the turnaround time is based on the volume of messages in the queue. Earlier this year in January of 2023, NSHN upgraded the Rhapsody software. And we are pleased to report that the upgrade significantly improved the performance issues NSHN was experiencing with the intermediate direct connectivity and the slow responses impacting vendors and facilities who were sending bill CDA direct automation. We do appreciate all your patience as we did work through resolving these issues. If you are new to direct or want to learn more about direct, there's a direct toolkit on our NSHN website that you can follow, find at the link provided. Before you start your process, 
We do recommend that you schedule a call with us and we'll be happy to discuss the direct process and recommend the best practices. A developer and a direct administrator will join the call to assist with any technical discussions. Next slide. CDA support is available on NSHN website. The first link is the main CDA submission support portal. Other important links provided on this slide are the CDA toolkits and the CDA guide to CDA versions. And just as a reminder, NSHN supports CDA versions that are valid for the past two years. And you'll see a list of the versions on the right slide of this right side of this slide of the versions that we're currently supporting. Next slide. Implementers can also get a, use the HF7 GitHub website for the latest ICG guides and get access to the XML, the related files, the schematrons, the CDA schemas, the samples, and the style sheet. This information can be provided, I found that the link provided on this slide. Next slide. A few more helpful resources may be found using the following links. The first one is the NSHN newsletter. The next one is the release notes and communication updates. And the last is the webinars, which is where you'll find the video of this webinar will be posted later in the year. Next slide. As always, we welcome your feedback. If you are not on the CDA distribution email, please let us know. The CDC team will also offer a quarterly meeting with vendors. You can send an email to the CDA inbox and if uh, you would like to schedule a call with us. Please include any topics of discussion so the proper team will be on the call. And again, please visit the CDA submission support portal for additional information for CDA implementers. Thanks everyone. Now we'll turn it over to Amy for any questions. Thanks, Sylvia. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone. That is um, the end of our official presentation, but we can take questions now. So feel free to put those in the Q&A. We have two uh, that have come in that we can answer here. Um, all right, let me move to the slide that Jamie's question references for the PI program. Okay, uh, so Jamie's question was, how long can facilities be in option one before they need to move to option two, and what are the deadlines for both? Great question. Okay, so as noted on the bottom of this slide here, facilities starting next year so when the requirement kicks in facilities can only spend one year in option one before they have to move to option two so let's say um the facilities are just starting out uh they're you know getting their uh ehr stuff connected <laughs> getting the pipes open that kind of stuff this year um and then next year you know still doing some level of validation so but they don't have production data ready yet next year for 2024. That's okay. They can attest to being in option one, pre-production validation. Um, they would just need to complete the registration within an HSN. That's a very simple process. And then um, begin the testing and validation. So that's like the sending of the test files to us for validation. So they could attest just doing that in calendar year 2024, but that means in calendar year 2025, they would have to send production AU and AR data. Um, as of right now, we would assume that it would be 180 days again, but CMS hasn't published anything for calendar year 2025 requirements. Um, so for now, you can assume 180 days of AUR data would be needed for 2025 for facilities in that option too. Um, and then regarding the deadlines, so the pre-production validation, uh, we're asking that facilities register and then send test files within, um, I think we're going to say six to eight weeks before the end of 
the calendar year of 2024 to allow us enough time to test everyone's CDA files that are going with that route. Um, so that would be like November 1st, 2024, they would have to send their test files to us ish. For option two, um, NHSN will not send any data to CMS. So there's not like the quarterly deadlines like there are for the HAI reporting. Instead, it's the facility that's doing the attestation. So like a yes or a no. And then we at NHSN just provide them the submission report as proof to use in the event of an audit. So they get monthly emails from us with just a a table that says yes or no with whether they've submitted at least one file of each CDA type, a U, AR event, and AR summary. And then the, the annual report for a given calendar year is sent by NHSN on February 1st of the following year. So for example, if they wanted to attest to production submission for calendar year 2025, or sorry, 2024, they would have to have their AUR data into NHSN prior to that report being generated on February 1st, 2025. So um, ideally, they would be submitting throughout the calendar year of 2024, um, but that is that the annual report is generated by us automatically on February 1st of each calendar year. Uh, and then the next question from David, let me go to that slide as well. Okay, so David asks, can you clarify the May 1st AR behavior uh, given to understand that transmissions regarding AR data May 1st or later would be subject to the deadline? Um, okay, so the ARSDS requirement kicks in with May data. Most facilities don't report a month's data until the following month. So for example, summary records for May cannot even be submitted until uh, June 1st at the earliest, right? Because the month has to be complete. But that May 2023 AR summary record that you submit on June 1st or later will not be accepted unless it contains that vendor ID and SDS validation ID. So it gives you, it does give you more time despite it, like the requirement beginning, quote beginning with May data, just because normally facilities don't submit their data until the subsequent calendar month. So similarly for AR events, if any AR event with a specimen collection date of May 1st and after has to include that validated vendor ID and SDS validation ID, Otherwise, it'll fail to upload. But most facilities do not upload their AR events as they happen. They would upload them, you know, come June once the month of May is complete. Okay, all righty. Uh, so we've answered everything in the queue so far. Um, any other questions that folks have, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A box. Um, so if you think of any after our call ends today or later this week, feel free to always email us at nhsncda at cdc.gov. And um, with that, we can end the webinar and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you, everyone.